wants to have a life that God intended you to have. Yes. We're not going through the motions. We're going to have that life that he promised us. John 10 verse 10. I came that you can have life in abundance till it overflows. Today's message is called Living Life Living Life Freely and Lightly. I'm actually doing my first series ever. Johan is very happy. <laughs> um, I saw something on Facebook this week on an atheist page. We, we have family, and they are not all saved. My baby sister. Probably doesn't like it when I speak about it. I don't know. Um, she's an atheist, but I'm praying for her. She's saved. She just doesn't know it yet. But I saw this on her page. It says, Sometimes you are unsatisfied with your life, while many people in this world are dreaming of living your life. A child on a farm sees a plane fly over and dreams of flying. But a pilot sees that same farmhouse and dreams of living on a farm. That's life. Enjoy yours. If wealth is the secret to happiness, then the rich should be dancing in the streets. But only poor kids do that. If power ensures security, then officials would walk around unguarded. But those who live simply sleep soundly. If beauty and fame brings ideal relationships, then the celebrities should have the best marriages. So, so even the atheists see life the way that we see life. My Favorite scripture, in, it's actually in, from the Message Bible, Matthew 11, verse 30. Now, before I read this, I was in a Dutch Reformed church for 25 years. Okay? When I came out of that church and I gave my heart to God for the first time, I never knew this, that there's a Holy Spirit. I only knew about God the Father and Jesus. So obviously, I never really paid any attention in church. I don't know. And I was one of the, you know, most people when they go to church in a Dutch Reformed church or those type of churches, when they, in grade 11, they like graduate or whatever they call it. And then most kids never go back to church. But I was always the good girl because I went to, still went to church every Sunday. Like that helped at all. But anyway, so when I was 25, I gave my heart. Um, Wayne is actually my school friend that prayed for me and he took me to church. So, and he's in my church today, so that's a blessing. Um, so when I gave my heart to God, I went to Little Falls. I went to a church and... Suddenly they're teaching me stuff about the rapture and about the antichrist and all sorts of things. So now I'm very upset because now everything that I've been taught for 25 years does not apply in this church. So, and I'm a person that if I start something I do it 100% or I don't do it at all. So I was going around driving my family nuts because I'm just preaching to them and are you ready for the rapture and you know the antichrist is coming and all of these things and um, then I met Johan and he started telling me about this grace and about this and and what he did was actually, it's actually so cool when, when he, he meets new people. He doesn't say to them, let me read the Bible. Let me show you this in the Bible. He says, take out your Bible and read. So now I've got my Bible and he says to me, okay, this verse that you think says this, just read it to me. And it's like, 
I started reading. I didn't sleep for a week. I was... I worked during the day, did the kids and whatever, and at night I just started reading my Bible and I saw all these things and I was very upset. I said to God, you know what, Lord? I changed everything when I was 25 and I'm not willing to change anything unless you show me. And that's what I want to say today is that we, we have people that share stuff with us and whatever, but we need to go to God and say, but Lord, what is the truth? Not what's this guy's opinion or this guy's, because there's a scripture and the one guy will tell you this. And, but what does God say? And um, so God really started showing me grace. And he started showing me that he's not what people say, but that he's a loving God. And that we can't sit in church even today, you can't sit here and just listen to me and go home and, okay, but this is how everything works. No, you need to go home and say, Lord, she preached today on, on life and what you intended, but show me this week. So when I spend time with you, show me the truth about my life. What you intended. What is my purpose, Lord? What is my destiny? Because most people, um, I, I, I heard somebody this week, um, they're 41, uh, they say, um, but I'm 41 and I still don't know my purpose and my destiny. But it's because you don't have Jesus. It's because you don't have God. You will never know. So my, my favorite scripture from the Message Bible, it says, Are you tired, worn out, burnt out on religion? So that was why I was in a religious church because there was no freedom, there was no life, there was no excitement. Then Jesus says, come to me, get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. And this is my favorite. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. Unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Now out of this... Most people will, will say to you that um, God requires you to work for him. And, but it says here that he will show you how to take a real rest. And then he says, he doesn't say do this. He says walk with me. Not walk behind me, not run ahead of me, but walk with me. Watch how I do it. And then you will learn the unforced rhythms of grace. And now I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. So if somebody says to you, you know what, this thing that you're going through, God wants to teach you something. Will you please remember Matthew 11 verse 30 from the Message Bible? Because <laughs> he won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on me. The Bible says in Jeremiah that, the thoughts that he has towards you is to give you peace and a life, not to harm you. I always say to people, so now you have a, a kid that's four years old and you want to teach him that if you put your hand on a stove, it's going to burn. So you take his hand, you put the stove on and you put his hand on there. Until it's red and burned, then you take it off and say, see, this is not good for you. Is that what we do? Is that what God does? That's what most people tell you about God. But that's not the truth about God. God says, walk with me and I will show you. That's why he gave us his Holy Spirit, so that, so that he can lead us and guide us into all truth. So, our first part today, how do I live this life freely and lightly? Now, the, the first one is purpose, priority, and plan. P 
People will often ask you, but what is our purpose? Why am I here? So I'm telling you today, I teach the kids also, you never say, I promise you, because the Bible says, do not make promises. Jesus often said, when he spoke to the disciples, he said, assuredly. So I assure you today that you will never fulfill your purpose and destiny if you don't have God. If God is not your priority, then you won't. Ephesians 1 verse 17 to 19. This is from the New King James. I pray that God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. If your purpose in this life is to have the knowledge and the revelation and understanding of Jesus, you will fulfill your purpose. It says that the eyes of your understanding be enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. It says here inheritance because it means that whatever I get, it says that I'm a co-heir with Christ. Whatever is his is mine. I don't have to work for it. You already inherited it. It's already in, in you. And what is the exceeding greatness of the power towards us who believe according to the working of his mighty power? Ephesians 4 verse 15. This is also a new King James. Ephesians 4 verse 15. That we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. So our purpose is to mature in Christ. Now, a lot of people think that maturity comes overnight. The Bible says that even Jesus grew in stature and in wisdom. Maturity is something that, that takes time. When, when you have a baby, it takes time for that baby to be mature. For that baby, to, that baby hears you all the time, but it takes time for that baby to speak. We have a lot of people that they, they have a, an encounter with God or something happens in their life and they have their testimony and they phone us and they say, they're not in a church, they don't submit anywhere, um, please can I come to church, I want to share my testimony. But you don't build your, 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 your church or your ministry or anything on a testimony. You build it on maturity. So often we say to people, but come to church, come to our church, see what we're about, and then you can share. But they never come because they just want to go around. And the Bible says, no longer I that live, but Christ in me, the hope of glory. So it isn't even about me. But the maturity will help people around you to also come to that level where you are at. You see, your gift will make way for you, but your character will sustain you. How many people start off with ministry or they start off with something and then they don't stay there because their character, they need, they need to be whole in their soul. You see, you can be how spirit-filled, but if your emotions are not whole, you will not stay there. Then our purpose also, the Bible says, go out into the world and spread the gospel, spread the good news. Now, I love this scripture, Proverbs 22, verse 21. Because you have a lot of people spreading a gospel, but it's not 
gospel because it's bad news. It's not good news. It's not good news. It says in Proverbs 22 verse 21 that I may make you know the certainty of the words of truth. That you may answer words of truth to those who are sent to you. Every day, I think you more than us meet people. People say, I want to be a preacher and I want to stand in church and I want to... But you have more opportunities in a week to see people than what that we have. Because at school, at work, wherever you are, and then it says that I might make you known the certainty of the words of truth. What truth? The truth about God, who God really is, and who you are. Not who you're going to be, but who you already are, that that will manifest in your life. Um, Acts 8 verse 13. It's the New King James. Uh, this is about where, verse 26, Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go towards the south, the road which goes down to Jerusalem. And then um, Philip was obedient and he went. And then verse 29, The Spirit said to Philip, Go near and overtake his chariot. So Philip ran to him. And heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, Do you understand what you are reading? So you have a man here reading from the Bible. And he said, But do you understand what you're reading? And the man said, How can I unless somebody guides me? And he asked Philip to come sit with him. So how will I understand if there's nobody teaching us? I always say to people that our purpose, you might not know it, but somebody at your workplace has been watching you. Because you are the only Bible they'll ever see. You are the only Jesus they'll ever see. And I say to people that, Often you have people that they say, but I don't believe in God and whatever. But let me ask you one thing. When things go wrong in their life, who's the first person that they ask to pray for them or help them? You. But how will you, how will you teach them if you don't know? If you don't know the truth about God. If you don't ask God, but Lord, show me. I don't want to listen to people anymore anymore. Who's God? Who's the Father? Who's Jesus? Who's the Holy Spirit? I want you to show me who you are so that I can be that light in this world. It says in Acts 17 verse 28, it's also the New King James. For in Him we live and move and have our being. In Him Our purpose, people say, um, you need to be perfect before you can pray for people. You need to be this and this. No. My purpose is to desire to be more like God. My purpose is the, the gift that God has given me to give it to the people. No way does it say that I have to be perfect. Jesus already did everything for me. So that I can give what, what he has done to other people. That they can see the truth about God. Then our priority. Matthew 6 verse 33. From the New King James. Seek first... The kingdom of God and his rich, 
righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. We have so many people running around, um, I need a, a baby, I need a new job, I need, but seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added to you. And his righteousness. From, also from the Message Bible, Psalm 51 verse 10. I'll first read from the New King James and then the message. It says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Psalm 51 verse 10. Then from the message, God, make a fresh start in me. Shape a Genesis week from the chaos of my life. I always used to laugh. This one lady used to say, um, when you walk into an office, she said, I know my office looks like three days before creation, but I know what's going on. <laughs> so, so when I saw this, uh, shape a Genesis week from the chaos of my life. So even if your life looks like three days before the creation, it's okay. <laughs> God needs to be your priority. People used to always teach us, well me, that God first and then this and then this and then this. And then Johan one day said something so profound. He said, God doesn't want to be first. He wants to be one with your life. He wants to be a part of your marriage. He wants to be a part of your job. He wants to be a part of your motherhood. He wants to be a part of everything. I was telling somebody last week that when I was under law, I used to get up every morning an hour to two hours praying and spending time with God. And when I understood grace and I started living that unforced rhythms of grace, I didn't do that every morning anymore. But I realized when I was doing that, I left God there in my prayer room. Because I spent that time with him and then I went on my own way. And when I started understanding and living freely and understanding God's grace, not have to stand up every morning, get up and pray, I'm taking God with me everywhere where I go. It's not that hour that I spent with him and, and then that's all that I have. I have him with me all the time. He's anointing. When I see someone or God will share something, I know that God has given me this gift that I can give to you and Wherever I go, I can show people the love of God. That is the most important thing. Now, for us to live freely and lightly, coming from a background of an account and whatever, you need a plan. If you say to me, I want to start a company, the first thing that I say, okay, we need to have a business plan. We need to have a plan. Are we going to have a trust or a CC or a PTY limited? What is your plan? See, what you do or don't do today will impact your future. People will often say to you, but you need to do this and you need to do that and you need to. But do you know that there's some things that you should actually stop doing? It's not always... I say to people, if you speak to people that are divorced, most of them didn't get divorced because the other person did something. It's because they never did something else. Does it make sense? So it's not always what you do. Sometimes it's stuff that you need to stop doing. And in this, this is not a step one, step two plan, not at all. This is just to say that the Bible says in Habakkuk that we need to write down our vision. You need to know where you are going. If you get into the car now and you say, I need to go to Pretoria, the first thing that you do is you check on the GPS on the map where you are right now. Am I right? And then you see, okay, I need to go on this road. Or, but you need to determine where you are today. People with clear goals accomplish far more in a shorter period of time than people without them could ever imagine. 
But you see, with our plan, the most important thing, Romans 8, Pastor Johan, verse 6. From the New King James. For to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So when you are busy with your plan or your vision, we need to be spiritually minded. Because that will give us life and peace. I mean, if you want to live freely and lightly, you need life and you need peace. I'm always reminded of this one friend. When he received God's grace, he used to ask the people in church, so grace will give you freedom. And then I'll say, yes. So, and then so they will do stuff that's still under law. So he says, are you free or are you dumb? Because if you break up freedom free them. So he said to the people, you can't bring grace or add law to grace. You need to be free. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 4 4 to 15 So your plan must firstly be with God, and to be spiritually minded. Even our lawyer that was here, that's not a preacher, he said to you that if you want money and wealth, see, God looks at the intention of our heart. People look at the outside and they see things and they they, they think things, but God looks at the intention of our heart. So if your intention is, Lord, I want this money or I want this uh, new job or whatever, because it's not just for me. Even in this church, we are not a dam. Whatever you sow into this church, we give on that. So in other words, when, when you get that new job, um, I read something the other day also. It said, when you earn more, don't spend more, but give more. Because whatever you sow, you will reap. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 4. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Spirit and of power. That your faith should not be in wisdom of man, but in the power of God. Now again, it's not what people tell you. It is about the wisdom and the power of God. Then verse 10. But God has revealed them to us through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things. Yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? In other words, you can sit in church for 10 years and you might not even be saved because in your heart you decided that I'm going to only give God this much of my life. I, I don't want all of him. But to the people around you, you might look holy. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been given to us by God. Because often people will quote um, Isaiah 55, his thoughts are not our thoughts, and he, his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And then they say, see, um, we don't know what God's purpose or intention or whatever is. No, here it says, now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been given to us by God. So once again, we don't search for the things. If you search for God, the things and the understanding will be from God. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of Lord that he might instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. 
So if you have the mind of Christ, you understand the things of God, yes. There is no more secret or stuff that God has hidden from us. It's all available to us. And then I think my se second favorite scripture, Romans 12, verse 2. Also from the New King James. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So do not be conformed to this world. While we were praising and worshipping, God said something interesting to me. He said to me that just because we are a small church, and there's another church today that there's 10,000 people in, and, and they see God in, in a way, because we are less people doesn't make us wrong. Because they are more people doesn't make them right. Do not be conformed to this world, but renew your mind. So what does that mean? Well, how do I renew my mind? I allow God to show me His truth. I allow God, I don't listen to man that says, no, this is how God works, this is how your life is supposed to be, and if you're suffering, it's God. No, I go to God and I renew my mind according to what He says. I'm not conformed to this world. So even if there's a thousand people saying, this is what God is like, I don't conform to them. I renew my mind according to His truth, who He really is. That is why it's so important, Holy Spirit. Jesus said, it's good for you that I go because I leave Holy Spirit. If you, and, and again, the Spirit is subject to the prophet. In other words, Holy Spirit will lead you to read something in the Bible, and now for 15 years you've been taught this is what God says. And Holy Spirit shows you something different. Holy Spirit is subject to you. So you can say, no, 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 I'm not going to take this because this is what I've been taught. Or you can say, Lord, when I read my Bible, lead me and help me. I'm, I mean... It's not always easy if you've been taught a certain way to renew your mind. Because it, it, it's almost like our new eating habits and whatever. I'm so used to cooking one way. And now suddenly I have to change everything. And it's so easy to fall back into those old habits. Because this is all new and it's, it's, it's difficult because now, now you can't do it like this. You must do it like this. But if I keep in mind that this healthy way of living is going to be good for us. The Bible says that you may prosper in your soul, your body, in everything, not just in our spirit. So in other words, when, when I have to do the cooking this way, I must keep in mind, that's what I mean with you have to have a plan, you have to have a vision to say, this is difficult now, but the end result is good. So in other words, when I read the Bible and I see new things and I see why it doesn't fit into what I've been taught, that I will have that courage to say, but Lord, you are going to show me the truth, and this is going to be for my benefit. Now, the plan, firstly, that we will use our time better. Everybody gets 24 hours. The Bible says that His mercies are new every morning. So if you use them up yesterday, praise God, they're all new today. <laughs> A man quoted, he said, He who fails to plan, plans to fail. Paul said in Ephesians 5 verse 15, Be very careful then now how you live, not as unwise but as wise, making the most of every opportunity. So this year God said to Johan that this is the year of opportunity. But how are we going to get those opportunities? By being wise. 
Now, the first thing that comes to mind is, what do I need to do? What must I do? So I want to read Luke 10, verse 38. This will tell you exactly what you need to do. Mary and Martha. Martha welcomed him into her house. And she, um, she had a sister called Mary who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore tell her to help me. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken away from her. So the first thing when people say, I need to have a plan and I need to know where I'm going is, what do I need to do? No, sit at Jesus' feet. That's the most important thing. Because there you will find that rest that you need. There you will see, okay, Lord, I've got ten things to do today. Show me what, what I need to do first. And it's happened so many times that I really had ten things to do. And I, 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 in the morning when I went to God and I said, Lord, please, this is, this is the day that you have made. Let me rejoice and be glad in it. Not this heavy, okay, I have to do this and this. And every single time, God is so faithful that I'll say, Lord, okay, I've got all of this to do. Show me what to do. And then when I did the full thing, the other things just all fitted in together and I didn't even have ten things to do anymore. Because I, I asked him to help me. I gave him, the, I gave him like that song that we sang, I Surrender. In other words, I can have all these plans, how am I going to do everything, but if I don't surrender to God, it's still going to be hard. It's still going to be difficult. The Bible does not say if you hurry, you can catch up with God. It says, be still or cease your striving and know that I am God. That's Psalm 46 verse 10. Now, this is very cute. It says, a uh, taco membership. Type A, obsessive compulsive association. So if you wonder if you're part of that association, here are some clues. If the traffic light turns gr green and the driver in front of you waits too long, like a second, you start hooting. These members like to do th two things at once, and doing three simultaneously is heavenly. If your boss is, a, is one of these members, and you tell him that you have a personal problem, he will tell you to sit down and say, you won't mind if I do some emails while I'm listening to you. These members cannot watch anything on TV unless they have a book, a magazine, or a computer in hand. These members pass someone driving right at the right speed limit and says, come on, granny, drive it or park it. These members, if their spouse or girlfriend says, let's take a stroll, they will respond, how long is it going to take? These members have never officially organized the um, membership because they are all too busy. In contrast, the Bible never said that Jesus rushed anywhere. He was usually busy, but found time to, play, to pray a lot. His total ministry was accomplished in three years. But he found time to play with children, to investigate a fig tree, to take a nap during a boat ride, to rest at afternoon beside the well, and to attend a wedding reception. The cure for the hurry disease is to know your purpose, establish your priorities, and day by day trust God to show you your true purpose in this life. I don't know if you've ever seen 
or heard most of us, that's my age and older, days of our lives on TV, the soap opera. I never really watched it, but I, that days of our lives like sand through an hourglass. But, but, but that is so true because it's, it is like sand through an hourglass. What we, what we choose to do or don't do today will impact our future. And I often say when, if you think about Abraham in the Bible, that's the father of faith, he lived his life believing God, trusting God. And how many generations later do we still refer to Abraham? So that's my question to you. Will your descendants refer to you? To say, you know what, my great-grandma, she believed God. She, she trusted God that he had a purpose and a destiny for her life. And she fulfilled it because God was first and one with her in her life. Okay, so that was part one of living freely and lightly. Our next part two, I'm basically going to talk about time also out of the Bible, Ecclesiastes 3, where there's a time for everything and a season for everything, a time to be born and a time to die. Now, when people read this, then they say, see, the Bible says we have to die. Okay. So now, once again, if you go to God, he will show you the same revelation that when, where's Ecclesiastes in the Bible? Old Testament. So after Jesus, we don't have to die. See, because now when you tell people that we believe in immortality and you can live until Jesus comes, the first thing they say to you, no, but the Bible says there's a time to die. No, for them, not for me. Then we're going to look at healing inside and out, boundaries, vulnerability, shame, and then most people swear word in Christianity, submission, accountability and serving, and then also comfort zone and challenges. There's some more extra stuff also. But I really want to challenge you today that, that you will go home and we all want to live freely and lightly, am I right? We don't want this heavy burdened life. We want to be excited. We want people to see that serving God is, is the best thing ever. It's the most peaceful thing ever. That you will really go home and that you will just Ask God to show you your purpose and your destiny and how there are certain things, that's what I'm going to speak about next week, about boundaries. There's so many people that are so thinly spread because they are part of this group and this group and this group. But did God ever say to you, listen, you need to do this? That's also why in this church we, we pay camera people. We, we try not to put a burden on the people that they are committed during the week to go to their work and they have family commitments and then they have to come work at church. No, we ask people to come serve maybe once a month. But that you will really, in these two weeks or three weeks, that you will assess your life. And that, that, that scripture that says the unforced rhythms of grace that that will be your life. It will be unforced rhythms of grace. It will just be easy and it will be joyful. I came that you can have life in abundance to the full till it overflows. But most people are so tired, so worn out, but it's time for us to live. It's time for us that when people look at us that they will say, but I want what you have. I need what you have. Amen.